In July, experts from the Hospital for Sick Children and other leading children's health centers in Ontario issued a report. It laid out several recommendations for how schools could be safely reopened in this province. With the first day of school just around the corner, let's check in on what experts are saying now. Joining us from Montreal, Quebec, Prachi Srivastava, Associate Professor specializing in education and international development at Western University. In the nation's capital, Dr. Lindy Sampson, a pediatric infectious diseases physician and chief of staff and chief medical officer at CHEO, a pediatric health and research center in Ottawa. And here in the provincial capital, Dr. Ronald Cohn, president and CEO, the hospital for sick children known as Sick Kids, and a professor in pediatrics and molecular genetics at the University of Toronto. Welcome to you all. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Before we start talking about uh, some of the issues that have come out of the report, I wanted to focus on some of the guidelines in the report. So Dr. Cohen, the first question is to you. How did this report come together? Thank you so much uh, for having all of us. And I think it's important to set the context of how this report came together. So at the beginning of May, when many of us uh, began to realize that this virus is going to stay with us for a prolonged period of time, we also began to see the impact this virus has on the mental and physical health of children. And we also realized that children weren't really uh, discussed at all, given what was understandably so, the crisis of the long-term care facilities we had to deal with at that time. And then when we started to have discussions among my colleagues, they would kind of be easy to write an advocacy piece on, on the issues that children are facing during this pandemic. We also recognized that school would have to look very different. We couldn't think about sending kids back to school uh, under the same conditions like before the pandemic. And as we were in our own hospital, actively living what it means to put in all the safety measures that are necessary to keep patients, parents, and families safe, we really took on the responsibility to put together this guidelines document, which is really a kind of a how-to document that was supposed to help the education sector with government, teachers, and school boards um, to think about how you can create a most health and safe environment for uh, children. And we have done this in collaboration with all of the academic children's hospitals. We uh, consulted with adult infectious disease experts, with public health officials, teachers, and parents who all have provided uh, input in this into this document. And, and it was really a grassroots type of efforts where all these people who obviously have a lot of other things to do took on the responsibility to try to provide a document that would help schools. And I would like to also take the opportunity briefly to say that this report was not commissioned by the government or by anybody else, as some individuals and media uh, have suggested. And it is a living document. We are constantly in contact amongst each other to collect new evidence, and we will continue to update uh, this document as new evidence becomes available. And uh, some of the points that you brought up, we will bring them up, but I did read the report, and just to reiterate something that you said, that the following is not intended as an exhaustive school guidance document or implementation strategy. The safe return to school is the primary responsibility of the Ministry of Education. So some of the guidelines that you have in the report include screening to prevent symptomatic individuals from entering the school, consistent hand hygiene, physical distancing to reduce likelihood of transmission, masks for students where possible, class cohorting to contain contacts, regular environmental cleaning, ensuring ventilation through open doors and windows, mitigation of risk for students with underlying health issues, mental health awareness and support for all children, a strategy for managing suspected and confirmed COVID-19 cases. Dr. Cohn, is there any one of these measures that are more important than another? In fact, the key is that we look at this as a bundled approach. The most success we will get out of this is by implementing as much as possible all of these measures because the bundled approach is where the success is going to be more likely. I think we have to keep in mind though 
like with everything else we do currently in our own personal life, we won't be able to eliminate risk. Our strategies are really about balancing and mitigating risks as much as possible in order to keep uh, our schools, our students, the parents, the teachers, and school staff safe. And Dr. Samson, why was it important for CHEO to take part in this? You know, first and foremost, just to reiterate that the response to COVID on the health and well-being of children and youth in our communities has been significant, and we need to help them get back to structured learning and their schools where they also get a lot of supports to help them stay well and thrive. And so at CHEO, we, you know, listen to and act on what families are telling us, and we were hearing lots of questions and a need for information from our families and also from our local educators who wanted guidance and good information about how to save safely return to school. And so we're very happy to have contributed our expertise in collaboration with our colleagues and partners across the Ontario to develop, as Dr. Khan said, a set of guiding principles based on the evidence to date. And a key message is that the evidence we're still learning, it's a, it's a, a new virus. And so we need to continue and we will continue to look at the evidence and learn from what's happening and then ensure that everybody has the information to implement the right solutions in their context. And that's also very important, that, that what the right number of bundles and the right hierarchy of bundles is in one uh, school, in one community, uh, will be different than that. what the right bundle is in another community and another school. And that's because the activity of COVID in that community is different, the population is different, and the school environments are different. So we're happy to continue to contribute in that way. And I noticed that uh, when I read the report, there were different guidelines depending on the age group. Um, and Dr. Sampson, since the pandemic lockdown, what have you been seeing in terms of children's mental health? You know, so uh, the overall uh, impact of our strategies in the community, which has been self-isolation and has been keeping people to bubbles and, and primarily closed the schools, um, really has had a significant impact on the overall well-being and very specifically including the mental health of children and youth. So we've heard from surveys of families across the province that more than a third of parents are observing some sort of mental health or behavioral change in their uh, children. That's uh, been greatest in children who are already living with mental health uh, challenges. Um, and it's not only about mental health, it's also about the overall well-being of, uh, of children. Prachi, I want to bring you into this conversation because uh, you're part of Ontario Safe. Uh, a two-part question, what is Ontario Safe and how did that group uh, come together? Well, I'm lending my voice to Ontario Safe. Um, I, as, as an expert, as a global education expert, um, as someone who has been working on the pandemic and the global education emergency since March. And I think I would like to um, start off by saying that most of us who are uh, working on this issue read the Sick Kids report with great interest. Um, and we were you know, very happy to see that there was uh, a medical response to the situation facing uh, children in schools. Uh, we did feel that there were some issues that could have been addressed in a more holistic manner if uh, experts in education and from an education background were more perhaps um, involved in the drafting of this report. Um, and yes? No, so I, I just wanted to follow up on what you just said. Um, you said some issues you wish they would have been addressed in a more holistic manner. What issues are those? So I think the first issue um, is one around um, curricular adaptation uh, to address exactly some of the concerns around mental health and well-being that uh, the doctors are mentioning here. So we need to understand a few things. The first is that the harms caused by school uh, uh, closures are not going to be felt equitably across different groups. We know that families and children entering this pandemic in um, precarious circumstances, they are going to be uh, further um, affected. And in a state of emergency, this is, we have to make no mistake about it. This is the largest emergency to face education in our lifetimes. I, I am not being 
Um, I'm not being a fear monger. Uh, we have seen, there's a report that just came out by UNESCO a couple of days ago that has said that two thirds of children on our planet, two thirds of children on our planet, that's roughly 900 million children, are, are they not going to be returning to school in a continuous manner or are going to be returning in grave uncertainty? When we look at education in emergencies, we need to think about what are the curricular adaptations that we can make? How should we be planning for perhaps two years? And how should we be planning in a way that takes into consideration the health um, ex exigencies, the bundle of um, measures that have been measured, that have been mentioned in the Sick Kids Report and beyond? And how do we actually marry that with what needs to happen in the classroom for our children to be able to succeed. Dr. Samson, you wanted to respond? Yeah, Prachi, thanks so much for raising such an important issue. I think we all completely agree. And the focus on, um, you know, this has to be an intersectoral um, collaborative piece of work. So, you know, the piece that health can offer is, is from the health lens absolutely the implementation and the guidance moving forward um, has to be done in a collaborative intersectoral way educators are the ones that have the expertise and knowledge to know how to get kids into the classroom on the using the guiding principles and of course the equity issue is so important and that's the absolute reason why we need to do collectively work together, pool our expertise to get kids safely back to school with the safety of children, youth, teachers, and all the staff at schools as the number one priority. So thank you so much for raising that. Doctor, well, oh. I wanted to pose, um, sorry, I just wanted to um, uh, interject for a second because I think uh, one of the points about kids going into school is that they're, if they don't go back to school, there are some risks. So what's at risk if children don't go back to school in the usual way? Dr. Cohn? Yeah, so I think um, Dr. Sampson already mentioned some of the survey results that we have seen in terms of the impact on the mental health. I'd like to add, though, that we also have seen and continue to see the impact on the physical health of children. So for example, uh, our emergency room visits have in numbers dropped but the acuity by which children are coming to our emergency has significantly changed as compared to previous years. We also see a significant higher number of injuries like scalding or burning injuries that often result from staying at home with less supervision. And last but not least, while we are just about to uh, summarize our Canadian data, we know from the United States that uh, just some very basic health measures of children uh, related to immunizations, for example, have dropped within a month by 50%. So I think uh, there are collective uh, impacts on children. But I also would like to uh, emphasize what Dr. Sampson said. It has to be a collaborative effort and really that the reason and the main guidance that our document was, uh, was trying to do is to help schools and school boards to understand how you can create a healthy, safe environment. There are multiple other aspects that need to be taken into consideration. And, and it's not going to be a one size fit all solution. There will be regions uh, with lower community transmission that may have very different circumstances in regard to bringing children to school than others. And it is really the vulnerable children who are coming from dense population areas that we are probably most worried about. Um, Prachi, I wanted to follow up with what Dr. Cohn just said. Um, within the past few days, we were hearing from the TDSB that uh, after they've done the survey with the parents, that between 70 and 80 percent of kids are going back to in-class learning, depending on whether you're in elementary or you're in high school. In your view, Prachi, has this, how much help has this report been? Well, I think I think there, I think we need to address a couple of issues, and I think there are a couple of elephants in the room that uh, that I, I need to address um, because these are the issues that I've been working on collectively with uh, globally and here in Ontario. Um, the first issue is the one of um, smaller class sizes, 
And I think, you know, you asked me about Ontario Safe. One of the main uh, messages of Ontario Safe is to uh, institute smaller class sizes to minimize contact. I think um, all the epidemiological literature that we've seen so far shows that minimizing contact is the probably one of the most effective ways of helping to keep risk down. And so how do we do that in schools? Schools are naturally cohorted uh, by class. Um, and in elementary schools, they're very tightly cohorted as they are because the, t the children are pretty much with their teacher most of the day other than one or two subjects like phys ed or perhaps they have a French or, or a second language um, component. But the cohorts are already tight. What you want to do is minimize that, those numbers of, 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 of interactions. How do you do that? You do that by minimizing the number of children that they're going to be interacting with, which means smaller class sizes. Now, of course, this has implications on what, what this means for managing a system. Um, and there are certain countries, I mean, Denmark uh, globally was one of the first that, uh, that had reopened its schools in, in April. It did that in April with uh, a reduction in class sizes as a temporary measure. Um, when, but the situation in Denmark was very different than it is here in Ontario. Um, uh, the situation in terms of the trans, the community transmission was very different in Ontario at the time. And even though it was much less uh, in terms of the community trans transmission, the class sizes were reduced until such a time as they thought that they could sustain the class sizes of around 20, 25 that we are more accustomed to here. Um, so that is one, I think, number one measure that we are trying to see, particularly as Dr. Cohen has also mentioned, we want to look at this as a localized response and a localized response, but broadly localized. And what that means is you want to have the broad bundle of measures in place for every school that includes sanitization measures. It includes increased ventilation. It includes really looking at what the ventilation systems are. It includes looking at broad-based testing for our education staff and for our teachers. Um, and that also includes mask wearing, which I know there was a certain uh, a bit of uh, discussion within the report itself in terms of some discussion whether on, on, on efficacy, but it does include all of these measures broadly. And then you wanna look at the high risk communities and you want to look to see where we need to prioritize smaller class sizes. If it were up to me, we would be looking at minimizing contacts across the board as they did in Denmark, as they are doing currently in other countries where they are able to open and keep schools open. The point here is we are not looking to have our schools open in a temporary measure. What we want is to increase the sustainability of that reopening as much as we possibly can. And the way to do that is to minimize our contact. To follow up on what Prachi was saying, the government has cited your report in decisions uh, in how it's uh, made uh, regarding school openings, yet they haven't followed the guidelines around smaller classrooms and ventilation. How then can parents and teachers feel comfortable about how safe the school reopening will be, Dr. Cohn? So I agree with you. Uh, while most of our recommendations have been uh, implemented, we also stated very clearly and continue to emphasize that <clears throat> smaller class sizes have to be a priority. And probably particularly, uh, as my colleague just mentioned, in the vulnerable communities. And we are continuing to hear from schools who are trying to be as creative as possible to minimize class size as much as possible. It is a critical piece of our bundled approach that needs to get as much attention as possible. I'd like to add one more comment though to, to this discussion um, because uh, yes, we had discussions, for example, around masking and, and the number of different implementation strategies. One key that we all need to realize is that we have to remain flexible and remaining flexible needs to by everybody be seen as a strength and not a weakness. We know this from the healthcare sector at the beginning of the pandemic, certain implementation rules we put into place had to either change based on new scientific evidence or sometimes based on simple practicalities where we had to make slight tweaks. And I think it's important that we as society realize whatever we put into place now, if we see that it might not be working or we need to change it, 
it's a strength and not a weakness, and it should not make us more nervous uh, than, than all of us are currently. Um, I want to push back on something that you just said before, um, and you said that you have been making smaller smaller classes have been a priority. Um, when we on a, uh, the premier um, has daily news um, updates for us, and this report has been mentioned many times over, and I don't know if it's the fault of the media, and I will call myself out as a member of the media. Maybe we haven't been communicating it well, but if smaller classes are a priority from your viewpoint, then why not say that louder and say, if this isn't a priority or if this doesn't happen, we can't sign on to schools opening in the safest way possible? I think that all of us uh, have been trying to make this uh, statement very clear. I mean, I personally uh, am on the record uh, with uh, two media articles in the Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star a couple of weeks ago. And we continue to advocate on all different levels and push uh, that small that class sizes are being as small as possible because like like uh, Dr. Srivastava said, it is really the key in terms of keeping cohorts small, keeping contacts small, because it is inevitable that we will see cases. And it should not necessarily be also seen as a failure here. But the closer the contacts and the smaller the class size are, the easier it will be to do testing, isolation, and contact tracing. And then in collaboration between public health and school boards and schools will hopefully allow us, like Dr. Srivastava said, to keep schools open. We don't want to open schools and close them in a couple of weeks or a month. So I think that's that's another key. And I would add a nuance that I think the real guiding principle, the fundamental key is minimizing the number of contacts that each child or each teacher has in their school day. And certainly class size is our, our go-to way of doing that and very important and shouldn't be um, negated. It, it's not the only thing and in and of itself, it won't be good enough. So we need to consider lots of other strategies um, including cohorting within cohorting, cohorting. So that's why the local response is so important because our school environments look so different across the province. There are some schools that are really crowded with small classrooms and there are others that have larger physical spaces uh, with less children in a classroom. And so the, let's not lose sight of the concept which is minimizing contacts. And so cohorts within cohorts of classes may be the right thing to do in one setting and the right thing to do in another is really reducing um, reducing class size. But things like staggering recess, things like minimizing travel from one class to another, um, all those sorts of things are very, very important. And I just can't take away enough, you asked at the beginning about, you know, is any one strategy um, taking a priority. The number one thing that I think we all need to do is keep the COVID activity in each of our communities as low as possible. And we all have a role in that. And that is going to be what keeps, um, makes it least likely uh, for COVID outbreaks in schools. However, what Dr. Khan said is very important that it's not, um, you know, we are going to see some COVID activity in schools and a very important strategy is rapid identification, minimizing the contacts and so that we can trace them very quickly and isolating and minimizing it. So that as, our, as my colleague just said, a sustainable approach to keeping schools open is what, uh, what we can manage and what our goal is. And Prachi? So this is where the question of resourcing comes into play. Um, and this is where the question of making those resources available to individual schools, to the school boards, in order to actually implement those strategies in a localized way. We have seen in the media, this has played out in the media probably more than any other education story that I have seen, um, that boards have uh, developed plans and redeveloped plans only for the ministry to turn around and say, actually, you know what, even though the TDSB had a plan to be able to reduce class sizes in, 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 within their board, and they were told they had the flexibility to do so, and when the plan was presented to the ministry, it was rejected. Um, these, I think that goes um, against the advice that we're hearing today um, from uh, Dr. Cohn, Dr. Sampson, and, and from the Sick Kids Report. It certainly goes against the advice 
that I myself have recommended to the ministry in a series of recommendations based on broader global recommendations that I'm delivering to the G20. Um, these are the kinds of flexibility and flexible approaches that we need, but we need to see the resourcing. We need to see the money behind that. And we are just not being able to implement, some of the boards are not being able to implement the strategies that they thought were viable in order to do that. We have to remember one very clear thing. We talk about minimizing contacts, which is absolutely key in our personal lives. It's absolutely key in every professional and institutional role that we play, whether in school or in business, wherever it is. But we are still in Ontario in a situation where we are seeing numbers of cases go up uh, where the R value that is uh, used in, 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 in other contexts in terms of how many people can one person infect on average, it's not just number of cases, it's how many uh, people can one person infect on average, is hovering at a level in many of our regions, according to the howsmyflattening.com website, uh, according to the public health unit information in many of our regions in Ontario has not gone down to a level that is similar to, say, Denmark or New Zealand or Vietnam or South Korea. Um, and I mention these because these are countries that significantly reduce community transmission before they reopen schools with robust measures. We need to be doing this on all angles. And we also need governments. We need our provincial departments of education. We need our provincial departments of labor, of health, to be working together in order to make this happen so that it is sustainable reopening. We have 30 seconds left. I just wanted to give Dr. Kona um, an, an opportunity to respond. So I agree with everything you have said. And, uh, and I think Dr. Sampson already uh, mentioned that it's really now up to all of us to be as smart and vigilant as possible in our own community to keep the community transmission low. And we have to see the flexibility of the areas where the community transmission is higher. That needs to translate into slightly different scenarios in these schools in order to uh, ensure that children can go back to school um, in a safe way. I do want to say, you, 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 you Dr. Srivastava, you spoke about uh, all the other um, uh, intersectorial people working together. And I am the first to admit that we are dealing with a number of uncertainties right now. But there's one thing I do know, and I feel very strongly about, the only way, and really the only way we will be able to get through this if we really generally, collectively work together, listen to one another in a civil and respectful manner. Because that's the key, how we are going to get through this. And I think if we could choose a bit more conversation over controversy at all levels, at all levels, uh, I think this is what uh, our children, our parents, and our teachers deserve. I mean, let's not forget our children are our future. Thank you so much and for all have... of you. Um, I don't want to cut you off, but we've run out of time. I really do appreciate okay. your insights, and we will be following this story in the next coming few weeks. And hopefully this conversation um, was able to answer some of the questions that people have across Ontario. Thank you so much for your insights, all of you. Thank, thank, you, thank you for your work. Thank you very work. much for Thank us. you very much for your work. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.